a $59 telescope? Yes, I'm actually doing a review on a $59 telescope. Well, first of all, what is it? It's a Newtonian reflector, and it gathers light with a mirror in the back here. The mirror directs the light into a diagonal secondary mirror here, which directs the light out into this focuser. And you put the eyepiece in here. This is where you look and you focus the eyepiece and you aim this way. This is the correct orientation of this telescope. To change magnifications, you change eyepieces. Now, for a long time now, the ultra-budget segment of our hobby has been dominated by the same two or three models. You have the Orion Short Tube 80, the Orion Star Blast, and the AWB One Sky, and perhaps a few others. Those run $150 to $200 or so. But here we have what may be called the ultra-ultra-budget segment of our hobby, the under $100 segment is dominated by department store junk. It's the stuff we always tell you not to buy. 99% of the stuff you're gonna find in that price range is just awful and you're never going to see anything with it. But there are a couple of models that sort of poke their head above the water and this might be one of them. It was created in 2009 to celebrate the International Year of Astronomy and I remember those times because we got a lot of people in the hobby back then. And so this is a tabletop Dobsonian, very similar to the Orion Star Blast that is behind me here. In fact, let me go ahead and get that. Let me, we'll put that on the table and take a look. So this is the Orion Star Blast, one of the telescopes we recommend. Uh, this one's been tricked out a little bit by our club. We put extra accessories on them before we donate them to libraries. But you can see it's the same basic design. It's just a little bit bigger. And it's also a good demonstration of how telescopes get big as you increase the aperture. This is a three inch telescope. This is a four and a half. Look how much bigger it is. If I had a six inch Dobsonian here, it would no longer be a tabletop model. It would be a floor standard. So as I was playing with this thing, somebody reminded me, not only have I owned one of these before, but I actually wrote a review back in 2012. I'll go ahead and link that below. Uh, reading my review back then, I can characterize my impression as promising, uh, but mixed in terms of the optical quality. So just so you know, th this thing's been around since 2009, pretty much in continuous production, and there have been several models, uh, variations, so to speak. One of them is the Orion Fun Scope, which appears to be the same model. Celestron has something called a Cometron 76, which has a finder on it. This is probably the most common version you're going to see. It's the black tube with the white spiral letterings on it. These are names of prominent astronomers and scientists. Through the years, there have been several versions of these. Some of them are special editions. One of them, for example, is commemorating the National Park Service. There is a special Robert Reeves edition with one of his beautiful moon images across the tube. And there's even a collector's edition commemorating the second Cosmos series with four eyepieces and a carry bag. Marketing people are amazing, aren't they? They turn one of these things into an object of desire. So one interesting thing that happens is all of these different versions come with slightly different accessories. Some of them come with a finder, some of them do not have a finder. Some of them have Kellner eyepieces, two of them, and some of them have the eyepieces that are not as good as the Kellner eyepieces. And I've even had a couple of you write me and tell me that uh, what's written on the box in terms of the accessories is not always exactly what you get inside the box. And what's more, the price that you pay may not correlate with what you get. In other words, some of the cheaper models may come with better accessories and vice versa. This model here usually retails for around $59, and it's actually at the other end of things. It doesn't have a finder, but it has these two chrome nuts here. This is the standard finder spacing so that if you do get one, you can put one on here. And it has the eyepieces that are, unfortunately, not as good. People who know telescopes know that the two worst eyepieces design are the Huygenian and the Ramsden. They are usually indicated by the letter H or the letter R on the eyepiece. So when I open the box, imagine my disappointment when I look on the eyepieces and they are stamped H and R. So the 20 millimeter eyepiece is okay for standard use. The higher power four millimeter is pretty much useless. 
it's tiny, it's squinty, you practically have to put your eyeball right on the lens, and even then it's not that great. Uh, I sort of wish maybe they had taken the money for the second eyepiece and applied it to something else, either reduce the price or give me a finder or something else. Uh, the reason for that, I had somebody tell me in the business once that from a marketing standpoint, it is easier to sell a telescope that has two eyepieces than one that has only one. Okay, so this thing actually is very well made. I mean, the mechanical motions here, the construction of the Dobsonian base, and the smoothness of this tensioning knob here, it's actually better than it has to be. I'm really impressed with the mechanical design of this thing. Only minor complaint here is perhaps this focuser. It's made of plastic. It looks like it's metal, but it's actually painted plastic, and there are people who refer to this material as plastic chrome. So, just be careful if it, you're feeling resistance here, or maybe you're at the end of the rack travel, don't force anything. Uh, if this thing falls down, it has an unfortunate uh, tendency to land on the focuser. You don't want to break that. Uh, I don't know where you get replacements of these things, and if you do, you're probably better off just buying a whole other telescope. Let's say you have one of these things and you want to go observing with it. I'll walk you through some of the stumbling blocks that you may or may not be aware are going to happen to you. So first of all, you have to find something to set this on. That may be obvious to you, but picture this is the ground here, and you're not going to be lying on the, the ground doing this, so you're going to have to set it on something, and this is one of the biggest stumbling blocks that people have, because if you don't get this thing squared away right away, it's going to come back and bite you every time you go out with it. So there are various solutions. Whatever you set it on, I would recommend that you try to get it up at least 30 inches. And the reason for that is because you're going to be sighting along the back of the tube, whether you have a finder or not. And if this thing's below about 30 inches or so, yeah, you can sight through it, but I don't know how happy you're going to be long term. There are some solutions that people have come up with. You can use a small drop leaf table, which is what I do. If you have a plastic tub of some kind, you can stack those. You can stack wooden crates. I've had people say they can take a garbage can, turn it upside down, and put it on top. No matter what it is that you set it on, it has to be something that you can walk around. So a picnic table or the hood of your car, while tempting, may not be the best solution. Also, you're going to find that whatever you put it on may not be quite as steady as you thought just looking at it. Uh, beginners are very often surprised at just how steady things have to be to look through a telescope, even at low power. The other thing to caution you is whatever you set it on, make sure it's got some area to it and it's not something like really thin like a bar stool, say. This thing weighs next to nothing and it's very easy to knock over. You don't want this thing falling on the ground. So the second issue you're going to have is finding things. Now some people say that with a focal length of only about 300 millimeters, you don't need a finder. I've had mixed success with that kind of philosophy. It's nice to have a finder of some kind. This one doesn't have one. Well, there are things you can do. For example, you can go out and buy your own finder. They sell an accessory kit that has a finder in it and some eyepieces that are unfortunately not very useful. Uh, I have this thing here. I've shown this before. This is my redneck finder. It's a uh, Rigel quick finder. This is a red dot pointing at infinity and uh, an elastic. And you just put this on here like this and you can use it like that. Uh, unfortunately, these things do cost around $30 or $40. You're almost doubling your investment on this thing. So what you can do is make your own. You could do this any way you want, but you can get a tube. I just got some cardboard and made a little tube, and you can tape this right on the side like this, and you can sight along the tube that way. Okay, so the third thing that's going to get you is the quality of the eyepieces. I will give these people credit for designing this thing the way they did because the focuser does take the telescope standard inch and a quarter diameter barrel eyepieces. What that means is you can buy other eyepieces and use them in here, or if you know somebody who owns a telescope, you can borrow their eyepieces and put them in here also. One thing about eyepieces, there are a couple of barrel diameters. There is this, the standard inch and a quarter, and then there's the two inchers, the really big ones that you find and that are quite expensive. There's a third diameter, and those are the 0.965 inch diameter. Those are the ones that come with department store telescopes, and those are the ones that are junk, and you won't ever see anything through those things. So if you're looking at a telescope or if you have one at home, measure the barrel diameter. If it's less than about an inch, I wouldn't even bother doing this. 
So here we do have an inch and a quarter focuser, which again, along with the smoothness of the motions, tells me that whoever designed this thing probably intended for you to use it. Uh, so, but the eyepieces that come with it, I mean, there's a 20 millimeter H here. It's okay, you can use it. I would almost prefer you to see some, you get something else. And again, it, yes, it does increase your investment, but if you do stay in the hobby, your eyepieces tend to stay with you for a while. So if you, if you do get kind of tired of looking through this thing, there's a couple of things you can do. You can try and find something in the 20 to 25 millimeter range in either a Kellner or a Plossel. The Plossels are probably a little bit better. And again, some of these versions do come with Kellners already in them, and you, so you might be okay that way. It cost you $20 to $30, and again, you can save this for future use. Your eyepieces do tend to stay with you over time. When I put better eyepieces in here, the view got a lot better. I was trying to keep it real for a while by using just what came with this thing, but I kind of got tired of this and started using my own eyepieces. You can really go overboard with this if you want to. This is one of my favorite eyepieces. It's a Teleview 19 millimeter panoptic. And when I put this thing in here, uh, the views got a lot better, and I mean a lot. The unfortunate thing about this is this eyepiece costs $250. You may not be ready for that yet, but if you know somebody in an astronomy club who maybe has one of these, maybe you can try it out and see if it's worth it to you. Okay, so what about the optics? Well, in 2012, I noted that the optics were okay, but not great. I would say that my impression of this one is quite similar. Objects in the center are reasonably sharp, but as you get out, the outer one third of the entire field of view is often not sharp. It's fuzzy, it's stars or lines or comets, it doesn't look good. And the problem with beginners is sometimes they get fixated on that. When you see something out of focus at the edge of the field of view, you tend to fiddle with the focuser to try to get that into the field of view. And when it's sort of sharp, the sensor goes out of focus and you have problems that way. So it's okay. My observing notes are littered with that word. I didn't think it was great. This thing did come well collimated, and in fact, there are three collimation screws on the secondary if you want to practice collimation in a relatively low-risk environment. So if you've never looked through the moon before through a telescope, with this here, you might be satisfied with it. Um, you might be able to find Jupiter and Saturn. I don't know how great those are going to look because you have to get some magnification on it, and I don't think the optics are all that great. I found the Orion Nebula, I found the Pleiades, M35 and M37, those are two clusters in the winter sky, and I think the most challenging objects I saw were the two galaxies, M81 and M82, in the Big Dipper. They didn't look all that great, the contrast was not terrific in this telescope. So, well, what, what can you do about this? Well, there's a little trick that people use, and it's this masking technique. So. On this mirror here, when there are problems with a cheap, fast mirror, which is what this thing is, they usually occur at the edges. The edges contribute a lot to the distortion that you see when the mirror is not perfectly figured. So what you do, and again, I, my finder here, I, I use some of the same paper, and what you could, you take a, a, a disc like this and you mask it down. So I've got this down to about two and a half inches and it just slips on the front here. This is an unscientific thing. I'll probably experiment with this, with this a little more. So I've stopped it down to two and a half inches. Did this help? Yes, I think it did. Things got a lot sharper, uh, but at the, the expense of a dimmer image, it's no longer gathering as much light. And again, you can play with this as, as you want. It uh, doesn't cost you very much to do this. Okay, so just because I'm a really curious person, I took this, this is my planetary imager that you use to take pictures of the moon and the planets, and I stuck it in here. Um, this was not fun because I had to focus this thing. I had to set it on the ground for maximum stability, and I had, it was, it was not easy, but uh, I pointed it at the moon, and I took a capture, and here is the raw capture. If, this is a good demonstration, by the way, of just how fast the Earth turns. In only 16 seconds, look how much the moon moves. But after some processing, and I almost hate to show this because I 
don't think it looks this good live here. What you're seeing here is a miracle of high frame rates, stacking, and wavelet processing. So there you have it, an overview of the Celestron First Scope 76 tabletop Dobsonian Newtonian reflector. What are we to conclude from all of this? Well, I think if you're looking for a serious long-term telescope, you're still better off buying a Star Blast. Save up the $200 and get one of those. And I think for the money, you're probably long-term better off with a pair of binoculars, but if you really want to get a telescope and get your hands on one and learn how to use it, this is okay. Uh, I think the true value of this thing is it teaches you how to use a telescope. It teaches you how to aim, how to look through it using the focuser, finding things, and so forth. Observationally, Again, it's okay. I think you'll probably find some of the brighter objects and then sort of run out of things to look at, in which case you can always pass this on to somebody else so that they can start learning themselves. And if nothing else, it kind of looks cool sitting on the shelf. So I'm trying to be fair here. The price is so low, I almost feel awful complaining about this thing, but I do know that some of you will go out and try to find and buy one of these things based on some of the stuff that I say here today, and I take that responsibility very seriously. So I'm trying to err on the side of caution, and if I wind up being a little conservative that way, then so be it. So hopefully I've given you enough information to decide if one of these is right for you. For hundreds of telescope reviews, go to my website at scopereviews.com. I should probably say that more often. I just assume everybody knew, but I've been doing this for 25 years. This is nothing new. Other than that, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.